There's one group of insects we humans rely on more than any other. They used to be predators, like their cousins, the wasps. But for over 140 million years, bees have developed hand in hand with flowering plants. Every third mouthful of human food is dependent on bees. They've even found ways of surviving in huge colonies of up to 80,000. Witness what life's like when you're busy as a bee. Around 200 million years ago, before most flowering plants evolved, our world was a different place. An expanse of green-leaved forests and swamps, filled with ferns and mosses. Some familiar insects like beetles already inhabited this alien landscape, but warm-blooded animals didn't exist yet. A revolution amongst plants was about to take place, one that would influence the course of evolution for many organisms. It must have happened gradually, but flowers started to appear on Earth in huge numbers around 140 million years ago, developing into a rich array of colours and shapes. Initially, it may have been beetles that pollinated the first plants, but wasps also roamed the planet, surviving as solitary hunters. Wasps that closely resemble those early ancestors are still around today, also living and hunting alone. Wasps can be formidable predators, each equipped with a sting to kill and powerful mouthparts to crush their victim. Whether they live on their own or in social groups, the aim of the hunt is to provide food for their developing offspring to ensure the survival of their species. But living with flowers had a profound effect on the descendants of the early wasps. As they became adapted to make use of flowers, some of these predatory wasps gave rise to new insects, vegetarians, some of which began to live in highly organised social groups, the bees. The life of a bee is completely geared to exploiting flowers for nectar and pollen. These act as rich food supplies for the bee and its offspring. Bees are little flower tracking machines. They find them by sight. Their antennae detect fragrances and the powerful wing muscles used for flight also support hairy bodies and legs designed to gather pollen. A long tongue helps them to lap up nectar. Probably the most impressive success story among the bees and wasps is that of the honeybee. It's found ways of living in huge colonies, up to 80,000 at a time a community driven by the efficient exploitation of flowers and the production of offspring. Honeybees can even communicate the location of particularly productive flowers to others back in their nest, maximizing their food supplies. Not only that, these bees have also developed ways of storing their food resources over long periods of time by producing honey and keeping it safe in special cells in their nests. It allows them to survive times in the year when they're unable to forage. And this is the secret to the honeybee's success. Other bees and some wasps have also learned to live in social groups, but their colonies are only temporary. In contrast to more primitive bees and all wasps, honeybees have developed a way to survive times of hardship when food is scarcely available. Times when their bee and wasp relatives are forced to abandon their colonies. The honeybee's intricate social organisation and ingenious way of exploiting flowers is the key to its success. central United States, we find a wasp that still lives a similar life to its distant ancestors that once roamed long-forgotten forests. It's a particularly big and beautiful wasp called Amophila, the sand lover. In July, the wasps are found clinging to grasses in the chilly morning air. Before they can move, let alone fly, 
They have to bask in the sun until their muscles have warmed up. In the morning, they're slow and placid. They're hunters and prey on caterpillars. Good eyesight, strong jaws and a powerful sting make them a formidable killer. These are all attributes that their wasp ancestors also passed on to their relatives, the bees. As their bodies gradually warm up and become active, the wasps engage in the odd scramble, but it's never serious. This mutual tolerance is only a step away from the complex cooperation of social insects like some other wasps, bees and ants. July is a mophila breeding season. The females are busy building burrows in which they'll lay their eggs. It's no more than a simple hole in the ground with an enlarged chamber at the bottom. Sometimes two females end up digging at the same hole. This is when their mutual tolerance breaks down and fights break out. It can be a useful energy-saving strategy if you succeed in stealing the fruits of somebody else's labour. The squabbles over breeding holes are never fatal, and eventually each female has made her own burrow. But neighbours continue to harbour distrust of their fellow wasps. Once the building work is complete, the female hides her nest from neighbours or potential parasites before setting off to find prey. She also makes sure she can find her hole again by flying around it to memorise local landmarks. A good sense of locality is essential for all wasps and bees. The Ammophila's hunting grounds are the grasslands surrounding their sandy nesting site. It's a larder of juicy caterpillars. Once a hunter's found her victim, she plucks it from its perch and stings it just behind the head. The caterpillar doesn't stand a chance. The sting is venomous and acts quickly to paralyze without killing. The wasp's nerve poison acts with precision on the central nervous system of the victim. It immobilizes by paralyzing only those muscles used for locomotion, but it doesn't affect breathing or blood circulation. In this way, the victim isn't killed, but becomes a living food store. But on returning from her hunting trip, the successful female is attacked by robbers. Their other nesting Ammophila wasps. It's yet another energy-saving attempt by the females, eager to fill their burrows with food. But there are strict rules in this contest. The wasps never sting each other and make sure the caterpillar isn't damaged. Clearly, fighting isn't worth it if there's a chance of being killed. And it's pointless if the prize is damaged and useless. Eventually, the winner claims her prize and the other wasps resume searching for caterpillars. Besides immobilizing prey, the wasp's venom also has antibacterial properties that prevent normal decomposition of the body, keeping the food fresh for her young.
Inside her burrow, each female Ammophila wasp lays a single egg and surrounds it with as many as 10 caterpillars. All of them are still alive, but paralyzed. When the wasp larva hatches, it's surrounded by plenty of fresh food. The wasp leaves her egg in the safety of the burrow and closes the lid. She carefully vibrates the tiny stones into place until the entrance is firmly sealed. She's like a human builder, settling ballast or reinforced concrete. It's a technique developed more than a hundred million years ago to keep her offspring safe. Having memorized the location of her nest, Ammophila also seems to intuitively know how much food she has stored, and she'll keep on replenishing the nest until her larva is fully grown and ready to pupate. Finally, the wasp leaves. She may dig another one or two holes as long as there are plenty of caterpillars to go round, but at the end of the season, the wasp mother dies, leaving her young to develop on their own. It's the next generation that will ensure the survival of this species. Ammophila's solitary way of life is no exception. The great majority of wasps across the world follow a similar pattern. Prey and hunting strategies may differ, but the principle is the same. Whether they hunt flies, grasshoppers or spiders, these wasps all dig holes, lay their eggs, surround them by food, and then leave to die. We travel to Europe to find that this is a way of life also found among bees. Solitary bees are common and may resemble the first bees that evolved in response to the appearance of flowers. One example is this Kalites bee. In contrast to the wasps, it's a vegetarian and specializes in collecting pollen from the male catkins of willow trees. Its jaws are useless when it comes to collecting pollen, so it relies on other adaptations that distinguish it from wasps. The bee uses hairs instead of jaws. Some wasps are hairy too, but theirs are made of single filaments. In contrast, the Kalites bee has branched hairs, making them ideal for the collection of pollen. Close up, it's possible to see clusters of pollen grains caught in the branched hairs. The inner parts of the bee's legs are covered in pusher hairs, shaped like nail heads to scrape the pollen from the bee's body when it's ready to unload. But apart from its pollen-collecting activities, Kalites behaves very much like a solitary wasp. She too finds a nesting hole, where she lays an egg surrounded by an abundant food supply, this time pollen and nectar rather than prey. When she leaves her burrow, Kalites marks the entrance with scent from glands under her abdomen. This helps her find her way back and also warns other Kalites bees that the hole is already occupied. It's an adaptation unique to bees rather than wasps. But in this case, there is one drawback for the flowering plants. Because Kalites doesn't visit female flowers, it fails to pollinate the willow trees. It's a one-sided affair in which the plants lose out. As a rule, the pollen and nectar of flowers function as a lure to the bees that pollinate them. But there are also variations to this theme. Some flowers, such as yellow loosestrife, produce oil rather than nectar, and they attract bees that are specialized to collect it. The oil collects on the flower's petals and anthers. Cleverly placed, 
so that a bee visiting the flower is bound to pollinate it. The hairs on the bee's legs have become uniquely adapted to its lifestyle. They're spade-shaped, ideally suited to scooping up drops of oil. But yellow loosestrife and the oil bee are a special case. The usual bribe acceptable to most bees is nectar. During their contortions to get to the pools of nectar, bees pick up and transfer pollen between flowers, which they also collect as a food store for their young. This red mason bee is another pollen collector. It inhabits burrows in wood piles or holes in walls. Its pollen collecting equipment consists of hairs on its abdomen, combined with another set on its legs to brush the pollen off. The bee is thorough and makes sure that none of the precious pollen is wasted. Collecting it costs too much energy. She's a busy forager, working around the clock to amass enough food for her young to survive and grow to become the next generation. Within a single day, mason bees may visit and pollinate up to 2,400 flowers. That's around three times as many as a honeybee. You can clearly see the heavy load of pollen stuck to the hairs of this bee's abdomen on returning to her nest. After depositing pollen in her nesting burrows, she adds a little nectar to the heap for her offspring to feast on. Having collected an adequate food store, the mason bee turns round and deposits a single massive egg on the heap of pollen and nectar. Like the pollen cache, the egg too represents a big investment of energy. It will have taken the bee between 10 and 15 foraging trips to collect enough pollen for a single brood chamber. She will never see her offspring. In the comfort of the nest, the eggs hatch into larvae before pupating, but they won't emerge until the following spring. Before leaving, she'll go to great lengths to make sure her egg is secure by collecting mud from damp ground nearby to seal the chamber. This is neither her first nor her only egg chamber. She can make as many as seven or eight in succession, each housing an egg together with a supply of food for the developing larva and kept separate by a partition wall of dried mud. Once the nest is finished, the female mason bee will seal it up with a final wall of mud. Two small horns on the front of her head manipulate each ball of mud into place. She might be able to build, fill and seal up two or three more nests, but then she'll die just like the solitary wasp mothers. Inside the chambers, the larvae develop, eating the pollen store as they grow. Other than being vegetarians, the mason bee's lifestyle is very similar to that of the solitary wasps. In spring, the young adults will be ready to emerge and start the whole cycle over again. Another solitary bee is the leaf cutter. It leaves obvious marks around our gardens and has a preference for rose bushes. But it doesn't eat the leaves it collects. It uses them to build nests. Like most other bees, nectar and pollen are the leaf cutter's food sources and by collecting them, it pollinates flowers. This is a vitally important function. Without bees, flowering plants would find it difficult to exist. 
In turn, bees wouldn't have evolved without the flowers. It's an interdependent relationship. In a way, by developing flowers with pollen and nectar, plants invented the bees for their own purposes. Parting with a few bits of leaf is a small price to pay for pollination and ultimately survival. Any hole will make a good nest, even if it's not perfectly round. By lining it with leaves, the bee can create the correct shape and size for her brood chambers. Instead of using mud to build the dividing walls between the chambers, these bees chew and manipulate the leaves they collect. The resulting juices make the leaves stick together as they dry. It's a time-consuming process. Leafcutter bees organize their nest in basically the same way as mason bees. It's a row of chambers, each containing an egg, together with pollen and nectar as food supply. Like other solitary bees and wasps, the leafcutter bee also leaves her offspring to develop on their own and dies at the end of a single season. In North America, leafcutter bees have a special significance. They're not native to America, but were accidentally introduced from Europe almost a century ago. They quickly established themselves in the new environment and became indispensable to farmers. Thousands of acres of farmland in the United States are used to grow alfalfa, used as cattle feed and harvested for its seeds. But initially, seed production was very poor. Then, the harvests miraculously improved. The sudden success of the alfalfa crop was down to the accidental introduction of the leafcutter bee. They're now so important that they're taken to the alfalfa fields by the lorry load in bee tenements, each containing thousands of individual nests. From here, the bees spread out to pollinate the plants. Although alfalfa nectar is acceptable to almost all bees, the design of its flowers is seriously off-putting for the Native American bees. The alfalfa flower's stamens spring forward suddenly, hitting the bee under the chin when it reaches for the nectar. The native bees aren't used to the rough treatment and prefer to look for more gentle flowers. This explains the poor seed production when alfalfa was first introduced. The leafcutter bee, on the other hand, evolved in Eurasia, side by side with alfalfa, and is happy to accept the slap in the face as the price of a meal. The multi-million dollar alfalfa industry of North America is a classic example of the close relationship between bees and flowering plants. But things can always be improved. In evolutionary terms, the next step was for bees to increase their efficiency at exploiting the food provided by flowers. A solitary female bee has to do all the work by herself, producing at most a dozen offspring. But by working as a family group, the efficiency of the bee harvest could be increased massively. In Europe, early spring sees the arrival of the first flowers, and with them, bumblebees. These are fertilized females that have overwintered in protected, frost-free hideaways. On emerging in spring, their first task is to find holes in the ground in which to build their nests. There are many different species of bumblebee each with slightly different requirements, but they all have something in common. None of them can dig, so they're all looking for existing holes, and there's stiff competition.
Among the first to begin nesting is the early humblebee. Just like a solitary bee, she starts off by preparing a cell for her eggs and establishing a food supply. But there are significant differences. Her cell isn't made from mud or leaves. She uses wax, which she secretes from glands in her abdomen. Like other bees, the bumblebee also forages by visiting as many flowers as possible to collect nectar and pollen to provide food for her young. Now comes the biggest difference. Unlike solitary bees, this bumblebee mother doesn't abandon her brood. At first, she has to work alone. But soon the mother is joined by other busy workers. They're her first clutch of daughters, hatched from this year's eggs. With their help, she's able to produce many more offspring than she could on her own. The daughters help their mother gather food and look after the young. Her dominating presence prevents them from breeding themselves. This is a crucial step in the development of bee society. During their first few days, the young bees concentrate on duties inside the nest, feeding and caring for their growing sisters. Their mother still goes out to forage for food, but as her daughters also grow into foragers, her principal duty gradually becomes that of an egg layer. Initially, she's still busy building breeding cells and keeping the temperature in the nest constant by fanning her wings, but gradually, all of these duties are taken over by her daughters, allowing her to become a true queen bee. As the year progresses, the colony steadily increases in number and food intake. More workers are hatching all the time. By now, many solitary bees would have finished their breeding season and died, leaving their grubs to develop alone and gaining no further benefit from this year's abundant food supply. Meanwhile, the bumblebees are still hard at work, collecting food and building their colony. But towards the end of the year, a different generation of bees hatch. For the first time, some of them are males. Other especially well-fed grubs develop into fertile females. These will become next year's queens. While the workers continue to benefit from the efficient workings of the colony, the new fertile females set off for the outside world. The survival of the species depends on the success of this generation of fertile female bumblebees. The males disperse to explore other nests in search of unmated females. After mating, the male bees will die while the females search for suitable places to hibernate. Once the reproductive generation of bumblebees has left the nest, the colony gradually ceases to exist and the workers and old queen die. Despite their achievement in starting social family groups, bumblebees haven't managed to overcome the last obstacle to establishing permanent colonies in temperate climates. They haven't found a way to store enough food to carry them through winter. Some species of wasp also live in colonies, but they reach this stage by following different evolutionary routes. Like the bumblebees, common wasps begin the year with a queen emerging from hibernation and starting work alone on a new nest. But unable to produce wax, the queen first needs to collect building materials. The 
The cells that this wasp is building are hexagonal. As modern architects have discovered, it's the most efficient use of available space. The wood pulp that the wasp collects dries into paper, a delicate and brittle building material, but suitable for the sheltered places where wasps build their nests. This wasp colony will develop much like that of the bumblebee and other social wasps. The queen will rear a first generation of daughters, which then take on the work to sustain the colony. Wasps also have to leave the nests to look for food. They're hunters and scavengers, but they're not immune from attack. They have very real enemies. It's another wasp species, the giant hornet. Hornets prey on common wasps, crushing their bodies before taking them home to feed to their own colony. Because of their size and painful sting, many people are afraid of hornets. But their bad reputation is unjustified. Despite their large size, hornets very rarely sting people. Their principal weapons are their powerful crushing jaws. On being disturbed, they're much more likely to bite than to sting. Inside their nest, hornets behave just like other social wasps. They collect their building materials from trees and build a paper nest. And just like the bumblebees, a hornet colony has foragers that bring food to the nurse workers in the nest. There are also house hornets, which work at expanding and maintaining their home. As it gets older, each hornet worker graduates from indoor to outdoor activities, and they'll respond to the demands of a particular situation according to their status and maturity. So, as the queen lays more eggs, the house workers build more cells, and the foragers collect more food for the hatching grubs, which the nurse workers feed to them. A fully developed hornet colony contains several hundred active adults, each working to a destiny programmed into it at birth. With time, the queen's job is restricted to laying eggs. As the colony grows, its food requirements mount up, so much so that a large colony may kill as much as half a kilo of insect prey in a single day. The hungry grubs call for food by rasping their jaws against their paper cells. This signal brings a nursing worker scurrying with food. In high summer, the food comes from buddleia bushes, where butterflies gather. Hornets are active and fearsome hunters of butterflies. Hornets also collect fruit and the sugary sap of ash trees. Characteristic scars like these found on ash trees are a clue to the presence of hornets. The sap collected is food for the adult hornet workers rather than the developing grubs. The social lifestyle of hornets is very different to that of the solitary wasps. They're as advanced as the bumblebees in their own carnivorous way. A single queen is able to recruit her sterile offspring to help her rear their sisters, enabling the colony to become more efficient, rearing more young through a longer season. Getting help to rear her offspring seems like a sensible strategy for the queen. But what's the point for her sterile daughters, selflessly slaving away until they drop? A peculiarity in the reproductive biology of wasps and bees provides the answer. Worker hornets are actually more closely related to their sisters than to their mother. By rearing their sisters rather than bringing up their own offspring, 
the workers are passing on more of their own genes than they otherwise would. After all, one or more of their sisters will eventually become a queen. It's this genetic link that has enabled social insects like wasps, bees and ants to develop their large cooperative colonies. When they're fully grown, the larvae produce a fine silk thread to cover their cells, allowing them to pupate and develop into an adult. But hornets haven't quite taken full advantage of all the possibilities open to them. They can't store food at all and can only eat whatever their foragers return with. Inevitably, there'll come a time when a new generation of hornets hatches into a wintry world, where insect prey is increasingly scarce. Their sisters will feed them as long as there's anything to be had, and this will be the generation that carries the colony's genes through the winter into the next year. Each of the new virgin queens will fly off to mate and then hibernate in a sheltered place, leaving her sisters to die. Like the bumblebee colony, the hornets disappear until spring, when the cycle starts over again. To survive the icy days of winter, when insects need energy like never before to stay active, social insects need to store food. And this is where the honeybee triumphs. By storing honey, these bees are able to keep their colony going through winter. The strategy originally evolved in the tropics as a means of surviving droughts or rainy seasons, but it stood the bees in good stead in the temperate zones. When good times return, they can take to the wing again in search of food. Honeybees are so useful to people that today most colonies in England live in hives, managed by people at their convenience. But the managed honeybee lifestyle is still essentially that of wild honeybees. New bees emerge from hexagonal cells to join a sisterhood just like that of their wasp relatives. But it's a much more advanced version of wasp society. For one thing, these bees are able to communicate with each other in great detail and in more than one way. Many bees use scent to communicate, but honeybees have refined the practice. They've developed as many as 37 different scent messages, which coordinate the behaviour of the colony both in and out of the hive. For example, from hour to hour, it's a scent message that tells forager bees how much food is needed in the hive. When they return to the hive, foragers may well find a consignment of house bees on the ledge outside, fanning in response to a scent message from within to cool the hive. The waft of scented air from the nest inside may also help to show foragers the way home and warn outsiders that they're approaching the wrong hive. Inside the hive, bees dance. The waggles of a pollen-laden bee tell other foragers how to find a good food source, as well as how far away it is and what quantity and quality they'll find there. It's dark inside the hive, so touch is an effective communication tool that enables the transmission of complex messages. Chemical messages can be subtle and versatile. 
they're transferred through the bees' antennae. When the workers feed each other, messages are continually passed between them. The single source of all these messages, controlling virtually every aspect of life in the colony, is the queen. She carries out no foraging or cell building. In fact, most queens only ever fly once in their lives during their mating flight. After this, they become an egg-laying machine and control the life of their gigantic family. The queen is always surrounded by a group of courtiers who collect and spread her chemical messages throughout the colony. Each egg she lays will be tended, guarded and fed when it emerges. But the workers aren't powerless. In theory, they can build a special cell and tend a grub to become a new queen. The only thing that stops them is an inhibiting chemical produced by the current queen known as queen's substance. As the queen ages, or if the colony becomes too big, there comes a point when there isn't enough queen's substance to control all the workers. At this point, the workers will rear new queens and the colony will divide. The queen's substance can also lose effectiveness when all the bees are restricted to the hive by bad weather. The overcrowding can mean that there's not enough queen substance to go round. The hive becomes packed, not only with idle foragers, but also with link bees. These are newly promoted foragers that still retain some of the cell-building instincts of their younger days. As the bad weather continues, leaving the hive is fraught with danger, so the workers tend to stay inside. It's now that the link bees revert to building cells, queen cells. As living space in the hive gets cramped, the queen's influence declines. Eventually, she will leave the hive with a band of faithful followers, each with a crop full of honey, to start a new colony. Swarming bees are reluctant to sting, but they can be intimidating. A healthy hive may contain at least 50,000 bees, so a breakaway swarm like this might have as many as 20,000 members. Usually they swarm near the hive, while scout bees go out to look for a new home. Swarming is a direct result of the use of scent messages to coordinate activity within the hive. These messages enable the swarm to stay together, even outside the hive. It's not clear how individual bees make their decision to stay or join the swarm. A substantial number, perhaps 30,000 or so, are still inside the hive, preparing for the arrival of a new leader. One of the special queen cells, built as the old queen's influence was declining, is beginning to hatch. A new queen is more significant to the workers than their mother, the old queen. She is, after all, a closer relative, their sister. Ensuring her well-being will make sure that more of the workers' genes will pass through to the next generation. The new queen will fly out to mate with one or more males before returning to take command. Her reign can last six years, and in the course of this, she'll produce as many as 100,000 new bees. But her first task after hatching is to destroy any other developing queen cells in the hive. The workers help her. After all, Honey Bee Society can't function with more than one leader. Outside, the swarm has little trouble in finding a new home. The delighted beekeepers ensure a new hive will be colonised.
The life cycle of social honeybees is in complete contrast to that of their ancestors and relatives, the solitary hunting wasps. But without the development of flowers, bees would never have evolved as vegetarians or formed such intricate relationships with plants. When flowering plants first appeared on Earth, they set in motion a revolution of gigantic proportions. Life on this planet would never be the same, and flowers would change the nature of insect communities forever. Bees and wasps both go back to common ancestors, hunters that lived a solitary life in a leafy green world. And the lifestyles of many bees and wasps haven't really changed since that time. They still live solitary lifestyles, devoted to collecting food to ensure their offspring's survival. But some bees are very different. They've become vegetarians and no longer go hunting. Instead, they collect pollen and nectar from flowering plants. The close bond between bees and flowering plants is based on a give-and-take relationship. Today, the majority of plants rely on attracting bees to pollinate them. Pollen is produced in excess and acts as a protein-rich lure. An additional reward is nectar, a mixture of sugars that's highly sought after by hungry insects. Even the bright colours of flowers and their scents are designed to attract the attention of busy worker bees. And bees don't always work alone. Some species have developed ways to cooperate and build colonies in order to maximise their efficiency and reproductive rates. Some wasps, too, live in large colonies. It may look like the same lifestyle as that of the honeybee, but wasps haven't mastered the art of storing food. And in temperate climates, their colonies are restricted to the summer months, when insect prey is abundant. Honeybee colonies, on the other hand, can even survive frosty winters by storing honey. Bees are vital to humans, and not only as a source of honey and wax. Worldwide, about 150 crop species depend on bees for pollination. Some of the pollination is performed by bee colonies provided specifically for this purpose. They're moved to target crops as and when required. But despite their importance, each year we put our own success on the line by destroying more bee habitat, reducing the number of nest sites and floral diversity. Yet we still somehow expect the bees to be there next season to perform the pollination we all depend on. In Europe alone, about 45% of the 500-odd bee species are at risk of being lost as a direct result of the way we now manage the countryside. If left undisturbed, bees and wasps are very successful insects, making the most of what their immediate environment has to offer. But now they have to battle with a new threat, human beings, who could undo the rewards of being busy as a bee.